This might be the most analyzed phrase of music of all time. The opening to Richard Wagner's Tristan und Isolde, with the famous Tristan chord, a dissonant chord that needs to be resolved. But here's what happens: an incomplete resolution, then silence. This phrase repeats again. This time, slightly higher, landing on another Tristan chord, which again progresses to an incomplete resolution. The third time this phrase appears, the opening motif of a descending chromatic line gets elongated, landing on an inverted Tristan chord, which yet again does not resolve completely. These incomplete resolutions are known as half cadences, like musical commas. Incomplete and demand a resolution to the tonic, but Wagner doesn't resolve any of these cadences. Instead, he further prolongs the resolution with silences, prolonging the two-note motif that ends each cadence, eventually coming to a full orchestral entry. And then, this: a deceptive cadence, one that resolves to somewhere it's not expected to go to. These opening bars set the premise for the entire opera. The Tristan chord, a dissonant chord that needs to be resolved, is repeatedly denied a fulfilling resolution. If we look at the chord itself, it is a half diminished chord, spelled enharmonically as a delayed augmented sixth chord, which leads into the dominant as a half cadence. However, what's special about this chord is perhaps not the chord itself, but the way its resolution is handled. The repeated denial of a proper cadence to resolve the dissonance presented by the Tristan chord. Is what gives subsequent appearances of the chord an association with an unresolvable quality, which relates very much to the plot of the opera. Based on a Celtic legend of the same name, Tristan und Isolde tells the tragic love story between Tristan, a Cornish knight, and Isolde, an Irish princess. Isolde. Who has promised marriage to King Mark, the King of Cornwall, and Tristan's uncle, was on board Tristan's ship to seal the marriage deal. During their journey, Isolde realizes that Tristan was the killer of her previous fiance, and demands him to make peace with her through a drink of atonement. However, this drink was mixed in with a love potion by Isolde's maid, and both of them instantly fell in love with each other. And started a forbidden affair that will ultimately lead to their demise. After being discovered by the king's men about their affair, Tristan was attacked by one of the knights, who left him mortally wounded. He was brought back to his castle in Brittany, where he was told that only Isolde could save him. However, just as Isolde arrives to meet her lover. Tristan dies in her arms, with her name on his lips. As we listen to the prelude, one of the central themes of the plot, love, is depicted by the music's passionate, meandering melodies and colorful harmonies. The melodic contour often resembles a wave-like shape. That interweaves with each other to produce a sea of harmony, which could symbolize the sea that Tristan and Isolde traveled in the opening scene. Phrases in the prelude are often irregular, with new phrases starting before the end of previous ones. The result is a disorienting feeling from the lack of regularity, which is further accentuated by the harmony. The lack of proper harmonic resolutions drives the music forward and symbolizes the unending desire 
as waves and waves of music interweave and overlap with each other. This unquenchable desire reflects the forbidden relationship between the two protagonists, a desire so strong but unable to be fulfilled. When writing the opera, Wagner was also likely influenced by the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, who proposed the idea that humans are driven by unachievable desires that would ultimately bring torment to us when we try to achieve them. Referencing this idea, Wagner merits music and text to bring across this effect, notably the Tristan Court, together with the repeated failure to resolve it can be seen as a symbol of this unachievable desire. Towards the climax, Wagner uses a series of dominant pedals that prolong the dominant, a device that further heightens the music's urge to resolve. However, as the music goes on, we realize that Wagner does not have any intention to resolve the harmony. But it is this play on the audience's expectation that keeps them on the edge of their seats hoping and longing for a resolution. However, the unrelenting waves of unresolved phrases drive the music into layers upon layers of phrases towards the climax of this prelude, where the Tristan chord repeatedly appears, each time stronger than the last, demanding again and again for a resolution. But as the music reaches the climax, it coincides with another Tristan chord that ultimately was denied yet again a fulfilling resolution, leading to a half cadence, similar to the music that opened the prelude. As the music dies down, we realize something. The Tristan chord is doomed to be unresolved. In fact, as the music goes on into the rest of the opera, Wagner almost never resolved this chord. And this is the perfect musical representation of an unquenchable desire. He masterfully manipulates the rhetorical power of tonal harmony and deprives the audience of something that is so essential and fundamental in tonal music. Resolution Only at the very end of the opera, do we get a resolution of the Tristan chord. In the final scene, almost five hours after the opening prelude, after Tristan dies in Isolde's arms, Isolde sings her final aria, Libus Told, or Love Death. The music of this aria is almost an exact copy of a passage from the opera's second act, when Tristan and Isolde consummate their relationship in a passionate love duet that was brutally interrupted by Kim Mark. Now, as Isolde looks over Tristan's dead body, she is ready to complete their consummation through what Wagner calls a transfiguration. While the couple is separated in the physical realm, they can only be with each other in death, hence the title Love Death, as if death is the only path they can take to be in love again. The music begins calmly, but gets increasingly agitated. Here, with other arpeggios in the strings that ripple within the musical texture, there are frequent modulations to unrelated keys preceded by the dominance of each key. Again, the dominants here give the music a forward momentum since they demand resolution. But of course, this resolution never happens, as the music moves to a different key after each dominant chord. A transfiguration motif appears in the woodwinds and is later adopted by Isolde in her sound text symbolizing her gradual transfiguration as she sings through this aria. The lack of resolutions and the densely packed motifs in such a massive piece of work is extremely demanding for the audience since they are constantly presented with music 
that goes against their expectations of tonal music. This is even more so for the audience during Wagner's time, evident in the poor reception of the opera after its premiere in 1865. In the review of the premiere, critics wrote. The stage presentation of the poem Tristan und Isolde amounts to an act of indecency. What Wagner does present is a ruination of the life of heroes through sensuality. After watching a performance in 1875, Clara Schumann writes in her diary, "It is the most repulsive thing I ever saw or heard in my life. To have to sit through a whole evening watching." Listening to such love, lunacy, till every feeling of decency was outraged, was, I may say, the saddest experience of my whole artistic career. Despite the initial criticism of his sentimentality, which was perhaps too overwhelming for audiences of that time, Tristan und Isolde proved to be a monumental piece of romantic work that had a lasting impact on the following generations of musicians. Including Richard Strauss and Arnold Schoenberg, who have all commented on the profound influence of this opera on Western music. This is a work so powerful that, for most audiences, it will be a transformative experience, whether positive or negative. At the very end of the opera, as we enter the final ascent towards the climax, a contrary motion between the orchestral melody and the bass line. Opens the musical texture, and the music here reminds us of the moments just before Tristan and Isolde were interrupted in the second act. As the descending bass line reaches a dominant pedal, one might be thinking, "Will Wagner resolve it this time?" As Isolde ascends into a transfigured state to reunite with Tristan, do we finally have a resolution this time? So that she can complete their consummation through death. Indeed, here, for the first time, the dominant resolves to a tonic in the bass, eventually resolving to the long-awaited B major chord. Isolde seems to have finally found peace, and by doing so, she has chosen death. Because only in death can she be truly together with Tristan and find a resolution to their love. For the audience, this will perhaps be the biggest resolution they've witnessed and musically heard in their lives, after being deprived of one in almost five hours of drama and music. And for Isolde, as she sings the final phrase, "Hüchste Lust," roughly translated as "supreme delight," she has found peace in death, and takes one final breath as the music dies away. One final breath to the last Tristan chord. With the exact same notes as the very beginning of the prelude, only this time it resolves. Isolde dies peacefully, knowing that only now is she truly with Tristan, till forever. <laughs> 